Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit wpsu.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at wpsu.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room issues. Was you don't ever say to her that I'm one of the shower points. She's qualified for services. We left. We're trying to take back our money. currently doing in autism. You may be familiar with the term LGBT, but do you know what the T stands for or whom it represents? You might be equally unaware of the daily challenges transgender people face. Penn State alumna Mara Kiesling is working to change that. A transgender identified woman, she is the founding executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Kiesling works tirelessly in her fight to end violence and discrimination against transgender people. We'll talk with her about what the T community is and isn't, about the issues transgender people face, and about what she and her organization are doing to address what Hillary Clinton called one of the remaining human rights challenges of our time. Here's our conversation with Mara Kiesling. Mara Kiesling, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for having me. Until the age of 40, you lived your life as a man. Then in January of 2000, you began the transition into life as a woman. Tell us your story. Well, um, I, you know, my story is in a lot of ways just like everybody else. Um, I always like to say I was born. Um, because I, I, I think not everybody understands the transgender people are just people like everybody else. Um, and I was born into uh, an amazing family with two spectacular, um, loving, smart, um, accomplished, amazing parents. Uh, and I have six brothers and sisters, so um, like you, I'm from a very large family. And um, I've known since I was aware of myself that I wanted to be a girl. Um, I think I have thought about this, uh, I've thought about my gender probably every single day of my life. Um, I think there probably were some days I was, um, you know, busy and didn't, but pretty much every single day of my life. And, I, and, and people find that interesting, but, but I knew right away that something wasn't, um, wasn't right and there was something else for me that um, I had to get to. Well, what happened in 1999 where you finally said to your family and your friends, I'm not comfortable um, being a man. I, I'm a woman. Yeah, it, it, it was a real easy thing. Um, it was actually in 1996 when I came across a college professor who was transitioning. And what I, at the time I was an adjunct faculty member teaching American government at a couple of colleges in the Washington DC area. And until that point, my whole life, I never really thought transgender people were people like me. And just meeting this one um, transgender professor at a transgender conference in uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, which had taken me um, two years to build up the courage to go to this conference and I met this person and everything just sort of fell away from me and I saw clearly that people like me did and, and could um, and then uh, the, the three year wait after that was really about my son being in high school and uh, like everybody I thought for certain I would lose my family and everything and I wanted to be there um, when he graduated from high school so I held off until um, until that point. To change, to, to go through the to, transition. To transition, yes, absolutely. I started doing some preliminary things to get ready, but, um, um, you know, being at his high school graduation was extremely important to me. Uh, now it turns out I would have been able to be anyway because he was spectacular about it. But, um, you know, it can be a very scary thing. For you, it was, uh, in addition to this professor, it was the internet. It was realizing that there are other people out there just like you and also people who were successful because that, that wasn't always the case and, and isn't always the case. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, I remember probably in about 1983, um, I was working for a boss. Uh, we did political consulting, but one of the things I did for him was I helped manage his little apartment building. And we got a call one day from a person who identified themselves as a transsexual and 
uh, probably talked a little bit too much when she was trying to rent a house or an apartment, but she noted that her therapist told her she had to move away from all of her friends if she was going to transition, and she had to start her life all over again. And um, she was trying to be upfront because she knew she'd face discrimination, and she was hoping that we would rent her an apartment even though she was a transsexual. It was a very scary moment for me, um, and, a, and a very morally important moment for me. And you know, I reassured her up and down that we wouldn't have a problem with that. I knew my boss wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, but that's the kind of examples I had seen um, until the internet came. Um, the, the thing about transgender people is we're not as geographically concentrated as other minorities. So we um, haven't always been able to build um, physical communities. Uh, once the internet came, we were able to build these amazing virtual communities where there are now you know, hundreds of thousands of people on the internet, uh, transgender people on the internet, and you know most of them, like most people, aren't going to be your closest friends in the world, but you have a better chance of really connecting with the people you can connect with. You consider yourself one of the extremely lucky uh, transgender oh, yeah. people, a and one of the reasons you say you're one of the few people whose parents actually helped you pick your new name. Yeah. Um, I, I can't say enough about my parents and how they've treated me my whole life, but how they... Um, how they treated me when I came out to them. Um, they hadn't been a couple in 15 years at that point. They were divorced. They were divorced, and uh, they're still very friendly, and we still do holidays together, but um, they weren't a couple, and they came to me as a couple. And well, I should tell you, when I first came out to them, my mother's first words were, I wish you had told me when you were a child so I could have helped. I mean, really, her first, well, it's almost her first words, but first words were a sarcastic thing because that's what we do in our family. <laughs> and my father's first words were, wow, what can I do? And they, so they came to me, um, you know, probably six, eight months after that as I was ready to go full time in my new life. And they said they were my parents and felt they had a right and an obligation to name me. And that's how I got the name Mara. And um, does it work for you? Does it? Does it does. It, fit? it does. Um, I, um, I I like having a name that not a lot of other people have. I've you know I've met some Maras, but um, you know I had a very very common name before. There were in elementary school there were five or six people with the same name as I had. Um, so now I've gone the other way, and I I, I really like it. You know I always joke um, about how lucky I was. I always say that uh, when I came out, I didn't even lose the family members I wanted to lose. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, obviously there's a little bit of a joke in there. It's, I'm not aiming that at any particular family members, but you know who you are. <laughs> well, that's so different than it is for parents today. And, and I said that we talked about this a little bit earlier um, before the program. Um, because of the Internet, uh, you know, I was introduced to a, a young girl named Jazz who was born a boy, but by two was expressing herself as a girl. And her parents, because of the Internet, knew so much more about what this might mean and, and the risks involved if, if suicide and depression and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how far the psychological field has advanced. Um, not to say that being transgender is a, a, is a mental illness, but... Um, the things you have to go through as a transgender person, particularly early on in emerging, and certainly as a child, um, if you can access some help, um, it can be really, really helpful navigating society. And um, you know, when I when I was five, my parents would not have been able to find that help. Um, in fact, if they had looked for help, they probably would have found very harmful help. Um, so. It's, it's remarkable now. I, I've met Jazz, um, amazing child. Um, I met another uh, child who was, I think, about six. The, the horrifying thing about her story was, and, and she was on a television show that, that I was at the taping for, she, her parents had sort of been very skeptical about her claims to be a girl. And then... Um, her mother picked her up at a friend's house where she had been sleeping over, and the little girl who was her friend had made her up as a princess. And she said, look, Mom, I'm a princess now. And her mom said, that's fine, but when we get home, you have to change. And she said, no, no, I'm a girl now. 
I'm a girl forever, and if you make me change, I'll kill myself. And she said, oh, don't be dramatic. And when they got home, the kid said, okay, I'm going to kill myself. And she ran out of the car and ran into the street trying to get hit by a car. And um, it's, it's something I think if you don't experience it, you can't understand how absolutely real it is, how, um, how absolutely not confusing at all it is. Uh, you know, mm. I hear some people say that child's confused. It's, it's exactly the opposite. I mean, the child is absolutely certain and it, if anything is confused about why everybody else doesn't understand it. Um, and, and these kids are just amazing and I've learned so much from them. You started in 2003, uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. Tell us a little bit about that organization, why you started it, what challenges you faced, and, and what your mission is. Yeah. Well, the National Center for Transgender Equality um, is a nonprofit social justice organization that works on federal policy and issues of national significance for transgender people. Um, so we focus very tightly on that. We don't do uh, media watchdog work. We don't do um, case work. Um, you want to change laws. We're changing laws and policies and um, um, and by the way it's working really really well. Um, we have this amazing staff, a, a remarkable board. Um, we're one of the smallest social justice organizations in Washington. We have a staff of six and I would hold our work up against any one of them. We're getting a lot, lot done. Um, and um, we were never heard of in Washington until NCT, ca NCT came around. When transgender people were discussed, it was always um, disrespectfully, um, or more often, we just weren't considered. And policies that impacted us happened or didn't happen without our input. Um, now we are very firmly on the agenda. Um, we make sure that policies that impact us, um, that the policymakers get to hear how it impacts us and why we think it should impact us in a certain way. Are you getting a seat at the table? I mean, how we, difficult is it to get to sit down with a member of Congress? Um, we absolutely have a, a seat at the table now. Um, you know, we, um, we're blessed right now with uh, a presidential administration. We're, non, uh, we're a nonpartisan organization. I want to be clear about that. but. The, um, the last administration wouldn't see us. We couldn't get meetings. Um, we were not... Um, the Bush administration. The Bush administration. We were considered scary or something, or, or they just dismissed us. Um, we couldn't get anything done. Um, this administration has taken a, an entirely different track, which as a political scientist, which is my academic background, and as a, as a citizen, really, I'm really, really pleased with, which is everybody gets to come and, and redress their grievances with the government. And if you're right and you make a good case, you're probably going to win. Um, I, I have found them remarkably unideological. Now, I know that some people probably think if they're helping us at all, they are therefore ideological, but it, it isn't that way at all. We have to prove everything to them. You actually said that 2011 was one of the most important years for transgender people worldwide. What, what, what kinds of things, aside from uh, Secretary Clinton's talk to the UN and, and a memorandum that President Obama issued to uh, U.S. agencies working in foreign countries about protecting um, uh, gay and lesbians and, and transgender people, what, what other things have happened? Well, we passed um, three state anti-discrimination laws. Um, that's the most that had ever been passed in a, in a, in a year. Um, we got a lot of other little great state policies. When I say we, I mean the community. I, I don't mean our organization. Um, we got a lot of really great federal policies. I mean, one thing that, that seems so minor that has such huge implications, and I, th and I hope everybody in America would think this is a good idea. The Veterans Health Administration said, hey, all veterans facilities, you have to respect transgender veterans like you respect other veterans. Okay? Not special treatment at all, just you can't say, no, we won't treat you because you're transgender. Um, we, you, you can't treat them as second-class veterans because in this country there's no second-class veterans. Um, and, and that was um, a really great thing for the trans veterans. There's some who can actually now safely go into a, a VA facility and just get the care other veterans get. Um, that sounds like a small thing, but it really points to the really big thing that happened. 
and that is we firmly got planted in the agenda. Right? We have a place at the table in Washington. We have a place at the table in a lot of states now um, and, and in the media. Um, we, uh, we had some amazing things happen. A transgender woman um, won an award for a movie she was in. Chaz Bono um, really, really got to educate America really good by being just such a great contestant on um, Dancing with the Stars. He didn't win. Um, he didn't win the championship, but boy, did he win, and he won a lot for us. Um, just by being a, just a decent guy who was out there really working his chaz off to, I didn't, I didn't know if I was allowed to say but, <laughs> working his butt off um, to, to, to win and, to, and just to represent really well. So it was just a great, great year. One of the things you're particularly uh, focused on is the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, uh, which was introduced, I don't know, several decades ago. It was... Uh, reintroduced with uh, gender protections added in 2007 and it still hasn't passed. First, why that? Why is that law so important? And in general, why are laws so important to changing attitudes? We did a survey um, last year that showed that unemployment rate among transgender people is twice the national average. Um, what those of us who are transgender know is that the number is a lot higher depending on how you look at it. Even the transgender people who are employed still are often dramatically underemployed. Um, when, when we get fired for being transgender, almost always we lose not only our job but our career. So, uh, you know, I, I knew a person who was a, uh, an aeronautical engineer at a NASA contractor in Florida. When she was fired specifically for being transgender, um, she was unemployed for about a year. Then she worked for the Florida Department of Transportation filling potholes, literally filling potholes, which is a wonderfully honorable job, um, but not what we as Americans should be wasting aeronautical engineers on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a, a lot of people under have the skills for that. She's dramatically unemployed. And then, by the way, she was fired for being transgender. So the aeronautical engineer was not good enough um, for a road crew with the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, she's now a cook on a merchant marine boat. Um, there, there's a lot of that, and, and, and what that does, it, it means we're less likely to be insured because most insurance in this country is through employers. It means we're less likely to feel good about ourselves. It means we're less likely to be able to keep our families together. Um, it, it has lots of different ramifications. And almost any time anything gets done for transgender people or for LGBT people as a whole, we get calls from people saying, yeah, but I still don't have a job. And that's why it's so important to us. Well, how do you respond to someone who says, but it was a choice for you. Uh, you had, for instance, a, a, a successful career um, in yeah. social marketing. Well, how do you respond to someone who says, well, you made a choice and this choice just doesn't, doesn't work in, in my company, for example? Well, um, you know, there are other things that are a choice that we protect with anti-discrimination laws. Um, the two biggest and obvious examples are being a veteran, right? We all believe, I, I, I think, most people anyway, but I think all people believe that veterans shouldn't be discriminated against. You shouldn't fire somebody just because they're a veteran. But you know what the really, really big one is? Religion. The beautiful part about religion is that it's a choice, right? You, you have to find religion and you have to believe in religion. But, but we believe in protecting people's religion in, from job discrimination. And um, so we often, uh, we often protect people based on, on their choices. Um, party affiliation is, is something that's protected in a lot of places. We don't want people to be able to be fired just because they're a Republican or a Democrat. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's that part of it. But, but, but second of all, this one just isn't a choice. Uh, and I know people who don't understand that. Uh, who, who don't feel it, it's hard to understand. But I, I think the easiest way to think about it is left-handedness. Okay, left-handedness until the 50s was something that was discriminated against. Kids my my were, father was forced to, to right. write with his right hand. Yeah, people don't understand that. And it was just horrible for these kids. They were taught to write with their right hands, and some of them could do it pretty well, but it, it didn't make any sense. But we were absolutely sure. Um, you know, being left-handed is called sinistrality, um, sinister, which comes from the Latin word yes. meaning left. 
and it, and it has biblical roots with who's on the left side of God and who's on the right side of God. And it was we, superstition that had people basically uh, yep. changing their handedness. And then we finally understood that that was all nonsense. And you know what? We're learning about transgender people now, but you know, at some point, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now, um, people are going to be just understanding that that what this is is part of nature's diversity, right? Not it, this isn't a perversion of nature. This is just how I was born, and I, I, I'm never going to be able to convince anybody who doesn't want to believe that. Um, but you know, giving up job, family, health, possibly life to be who you are, uh, you don't do that on a whim. You mentioned life, and the reality is, according to some estimates, uh, a transgender person is murdered once a month in this country. That we know of. That, that we know of. Uh, I go to vigils all the time for transgender people who are murdered, and um, it's it's one of our absolute biggest problems. And I, uh, you know, the, the truth is the transgender people who murdered aren't in my demographic usually. Um, they're almost always low income, um, young, transgender women of color, um, often immigrants, often sex workers. Um, the reason for that is all of those things in the United States, youth, poor, people of color, sex worker, women, all of those folks are, oh, and transgender, are more likely to be victims of crime. When you're multiple things, mm -hmm. uh, when you're multiple of those, you're, you're even more likely to be a victim. Um, and transgender people, you know, run the gamut of, uh, and, and, and you know, very often the killers then try to justify it by saying like, but I found out it was an it, um, or I found out it was a dude. And, and they assume everybody's going to say, oh, well, that's why you killed the person. I, that makes perfect sense to us. And there, there's even a defense, transgender panic, I think, is the name for it. That's right. Um, and usually what happens is, uh, with the transgender panic defense, is some man has had sex with a transgender person and then is suddenly afraid of who knows what. I mean, they knew they were having sex with a transgender person and they suddenly panic that somebody is going to disrespect them or they weren't being macho enough. And to prove that they're macho, they, they kill the person. And uh, that's been so discredited now, just like the gay panic defense. Um, you know, men in those situations were often killing gay men and saying, oh, he led me into it. And um, it's a real serious societal problem and transgender people just face horrible violence. I want to tell you that the, the most amazing statistic, and it's a little tiny number, 1%. So one of the hidden numbers in the survey we did last year was just 1%. So that doesn't seem like a lot until I tell you what it is. 1% of the transgender people in our sample had been physically attacked in a hospital emergency room. Uh, I mean, that, that, that you can be physically attacked in a hospital emergency room where not only are you incredibly vulnerable, but you're seeking help and you're physically attacked. If that's happening to 1% of us in emergency rooms, you can imagine what's happening to homeless transgender people um, or to um, transgender people in schools. Have you yourself uh, suffered attacks or assaults because of being transgender? I, I've had two very close calls, including one about three weeks ago. It, uh, the other one was 10 years ago, and then three weeks ago I was walking on the street in Washington, D.C., and a gentleman just walked up to me, and hey, it was an odd thing. He held up two dollars and he said, you dropped these. And, and I looked to try to fix, because I didn't think I had, and then he started screaming, I knew it, I knew it, it's a man, it's a man. Hey, everybody, come here, it's a man. He started screaming, and I was just like, you know what, keep your two dollars, I'm going to get on a bus. And I just got on the, the bus that was right there and went away. Um, you know, that's not the kind of thing, that's not the kind of situation to be brave in. Um, you know, I was as brave as I had to be. I got out of, you know, this person was Arms trouble. Away. I just walked away. You said once, I am one of the most optimistic people you'll find in the LGBT movement. How optimistic are you uh, about the future of, of today's young people who come out? Oh my gosh. 
uh, uh, remarkably. Um, and, and most importantly, because they now have friends. Um, they can now come out and, and rarely will they lose everybody. Now that still does sometimes happen, but now more and more straight kids are really stepping up for their LGBT um, uh, friends and, and, and relatives. And that's just an amazing thing. You know, when I was here at Penn State, um, there were no out gay people. Uh, I, I know that sounds weird. I, you know, I was here, uh, you know, I started here in 1977, and there was no gay community, um, let alone transgender community. And I, I recently spoke in Omaha at, at a youth group, and there were, I think, four kids who were out as transgender in public school. And I just, I, I mean, I was shocked by that. I, when I was in high school in the mid-70s, I, I don't know if I'm right, but I don't think there was a single out transgender kid in the whole country in public mm. schools. Um, so I'm really optimistic for them. You know, kids get it. Um, you know, kids now grow up very multiculturally in, in most places, not all places. And they grow up knowing gay kids. And uh, the, the strength and the courage of, of these trans kids and these gay kids is just remarkable to me. But the strength and the courage of the ally kids who are standing up for them, um, every bit as, as awesome. Mara Kiesling, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Mara Kiesling. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll find more video from this interview. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.